Detroit. The Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village. Table of Contents, Detroit and Greenfield Village. All about Detroit. The Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village. With visiting and touring information. Geography. History. Attractions. And other points of interest. Dr. Sydney Socloth. Dr. Sydney22 at gmail.com. 2023. Narration by Dr. Sydney Socloth. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Cole Tove. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash yt navigator. Detroit. The Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village. This is Michigan in the upper Midwest of the U.S., between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. On the southern border of Michigan are Ohio and Indiana. To the north of Michigan, across Lake Huron and Lake Superior, is the Canadian province of Ontario. Detroit. Detroit is the largest city in Michigan in the seat of Wayne County. The word Detroit is from French, Detroit meaning straight, referring to the Detroit River as a strait between Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie. Detroit is located in southeastern Michigan on the Detroit River. Detroit is a major port city on the Detroit River in the Midwest region of the United States. Located north of Windsor, Ontario, Detroit is the only major U.S. city that looks south to Canada. Detroit was founded on July 24, 1701, by the Frenchman Antoine de la Muff Cadillac. Known as the world's traditional automotive center, Detroit is a metonym for the American automobile industry and an important source of popular music legacy celebrated by the city's two familiar nicknames, the Motor City and Motown. Detroit ranks as the 28th most populous city in the U.S., with 617,000 residents and with a metropolitan area population of 4.39 million. At its peak in 1950, the city was the fourth largest in America, but has since seen a major shift in its population to the suburbs. The name Detroit sometimes refers to the Metro Detroit area, a sprawling region with a population of 3.5 million for the metropolitan statistical area and a population of 5.3 million for the Detroit Warren Ann Arbor combined statistical area. The Detroit Windsor area a critical commercial link straddling the Canada-U.S. border, has a population of about 5,700,000. The History of Detroit The city's name comes from the Detroit River. The French called it Le Détroit du Lac Erie, meaning the Strait of Lake Erie, linking Lake Huron and Lake Erie in the historical context. The strait included Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River. Traveling up the Detroit River on the ship Lee Griffin, owned by LaSalle, Father Louis Hennepin noted the north bank of the river as an ideal location for a settlement. Traveling up the Detroit River on the ship Lee Griffin, owned by LaSalle, Father Louis Hennepin noted the north bank of the river as an ideal location for a settlement. There. In 1701, the French officer Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac, along with 51 additional French Canadians, founded a settlement called Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit, naming it after the Conde de Pontchartrain, Minister of Marine under Louis XIV. France offered free land to attract families to Detroit. Detroit grew to 800 people in 1765 to become the largest city between Montreal and New Orleans. Francois-Marie Picotet, Sieur de Bailestre, 
Montreal 1719-1793 Was the last French military commander at Fort Detroit? 1758-1760 Surrendering the fort on November 29, 1760 to the British The regions for trade was an important economic activity. Detroit's city flag reflects this French heritage. During the French and Indian War, 1760, British troops gained control and shortened the name to Detroit. Several tribes led by Chief Pontiac, an Ottawa leader, launched Pontiac's Rebellion, 1763, including a siege of Fort Detroit. Partially in response to this, the British Royal Proclamation of 1763 included restrictions on white settlement in unceded Indian territories. Detroit passed to the United States under the Jay Treaty, 1796, in 1805. A fire destroyed most of the settlement. A river warehouse and brick chimneys of the wooden homes were the sole structures to survive. Detroit fell to British troops during the War of 1812 in the Siege of Detroit, was recaptured by the United States in 1813, and incorporated as a city in 1815. During the late 1800s and early 1900s, many of the city's Gilded Age mansions and buildings arose. Detroit was referred to as the Paris of the West for its architecture and for Washington Boulevard recently electrified by Thomas Edison. Strategically located along the Great Lakes Waterway, Detroit emerged as a transportation hub. The city had grown steadily since the 1830s with the rise of shipping, shipbuilding, and manufacturing industries. In 1896, a thriving carriage trade prompted Henry Ford to build his first automobile in a rented workshop on Mack Avenue. In 1904 he founded the Ford Moto Company. Ford's manufacturing and those of automotive pioneers William C. Durant, the Dodge Brothers, Packard, and Walter Chrysler, all reinforced Detroit's status as the world's automotive capital. It also served to encourage truck manufacturers such as Rapid and Grabowski. Labos Drive climaxed in the 1930s when the United Auto Workers became involved in bitter disputes with Detroit's auto manufacturers. The labor activism of those years brought notoriety to union leaders such as Jimmy Hoffa and Walter Ruther. The gasoline crises of 1973 and 1979 impacted the U.S. auto industry, as small cars from foreign makers made inroads. Renaissance has been a perennial buzzword among city leaders. Reinforced by the construction of the Renaissance Center in the late 1970s. This complex of skyscrapers. Designed as a city within a city slowed but was unable to reverse the trend of businesses leaving downtown Detroit until the 1990s. This is a map of downtown Detroit. In the 1990s, the city began to receive a revival, with much of it centered in downtown Detroit. America to we had Detroit since 1993 arose on the city skyline. In the ensuing years, three casinos opened in Detroit, MGM Grand Detroit, Motor City Casino, and Greek Town Casino, which debuted as resorts in 2007 and 2008. The city also saw the historic book Cadillac Hotel and the Fort Shelby Hotel reopen for the first time in over 20 years. New downtown stadiums were constructed for the Detroit Tigers and Detroit Lions in 2000 and 2002, respectively. This put the Lions home stadium in the city proper for the first time since 1974. The city's riverfront is the focus of much development following the example of Windsor, Ontario which began its waterfront buckland conversion in the 1990s.
In 2007, the first portions of the Detroit River Walk we laid, including miles of parks and fountains. This new urban development in Detroit is a mainstay in the city's plan to enhance its economy through tourism. Along the river, upscale million-dollar condominiums are going up, such as Watermark Detroit, some of the most expensive the city has ever seen. Climate The climate of Detroit Will it be hot, or will it be cold in Detroit? Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in Detroit. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius throughout the year in Detroit. Rainfall in Detroit. Here is the average precipitation in inches throughout the year in Detroit. The total yearly rainfall is 30 inches or 753 millimeters. Here is the average precipitation in millimeters throughout the year in Detroit. Here is the average number of days per month with precipitation throughout the year in Detroit. We see that it rains about 10 days every month throughout the year. This is a map of Michigan. This is the southeastern Michigan area around Detroit. Just to the south and west of Detroit is the suburb of Dearborn. This is the location of the massive Ford River Rouge Industrial Complex. Just to the south and west of Detroit is the suburb of Dearborn. This is the location of the massive Ford River Rouge Industrial Complex. Construction began in 1917, and when it was completed in 1928, it had become the largest integrated factory in the world. This is a view of the Ford River Rouge facility. Greenfield Village and the Henry Ford Museum Located nearby in Dearborn is the Henry Ford Museum. And adjacent to that is Greenfield Village. The Henry Ford, a national historic landmark, also known as the Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village, and more formally as the Edison Institute, in the metro Detroit suburb of Dearborn, is the nation's largest indoor-outdoor history museum complex. Named for its founder, the noted automobile industrialist Henry Ford, and based on his desire to preserve items of historical significance and portray the Industrial Revolution, the property houses a vast array of famous homes, machinery, exhibits, and Americana. The collection contains many rare exhibits, including John F. Kennedy's presidential limousine, Abraham Lincoln's chair from Ford's Theater, Thomas Edison's laboratory, the Wright Brothers' bicycle shop, and the Rosa Parks bus. Henry Ford said of his museum, I am collecting the history of our people as written into things their hands made and used. When we are through, we shall have reproduced American life as lived. And that, I think, is the best way of preserving at least a part of our history and tradition. President Herbert Hoover dedicated the Edison Institute to Ford's longtime friend Thomas Edison on October 21, 1929 the 50th anniversary of the invention of the incandescent light bulb. Of the 260 people in attendance, some of the more famous were Marie Curie, George Eastman, John D. Rockefeller, Will Rogers, and Orville Wright. The dedication was carried on the radio, with listeners encouraged to turn off their electric lights until a switch was flipped at the museum. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, Thomas Alva Edison, Harper's Monthly, September 1932. The Edison Institute was originally composed of the Henry Ford Museum, 
Greenfield Village, and the Greenfield Village Schools, an experimental learning facility. Initially, Greenfield Village and the Henry Ford Museum were owned by the Ford Motor Company, which cooperates with Henry Ford to provide the Ford Rouge factory tour and is a sponsor of the school. The Henry Ford Museum began as Henry Ford's collection of historical objects, which he began collecting as far back as 1906. Today, the 12 acres, 49,000 square meters, site is primarily a collection of antique machinery, pop culture items, automobiles, locomotives, aircraft, and other items. The museum has many items of historical interest. Greenfield Village Greenfield Village is considered to be the largest outdoor museum in America. Nearly 100 historical buildings were moved to the property from their original locations and arranged in a village setting. The museum intends to show how Americans have lived and worked since the founding of the country. Patrons in Tethergate Passing by the Josephine Ford Memorial Fountain and Benson Ford Research Center. The village includes buildings from the 17th century to the present, many of which are staffed by costumed interpreters who conduct period tasks like farming, sewing, and cooking. This is a map of Greenfield Village. This is another map of Greenfield Village. This is a map of the Mine Street and Railroad Junction areas of Greenfield Village. This is a map of the Liberty Craftworks and Working Farms areas of Greenfield Village. This is a map of the Henry Ford's Model T area of Greenfield Village. This is a map of the Porches and Parlors area of Greenfield Village. This is a map of the Edison at Work area of Greenfield Village. We will next have a short video clip on the Henry Ford Greenfield Village. Greenfield Village is absolutely a national treasure. This is an amazing place to step back in time. We have actors actually portraying historical characters. Something occurred to me that if this were a set of wings, hear Wilbur and Orville Wright tell of their experiences at Kitty Hawk, it's amazing. What you're liable to run into is how average Americans were living in the 1700s, the time of the Civil War, and up through the early part of the 20th century. It's called either a high wheel or an ordinary. It's an English invention. It came to the United States in 1876. Oh, my favorite thing to do is ride the Model T's. It's a real good time. I think the farm experience is my children's favorite part. They get to see the women cook in the kitchen. See the farmers till in the fields. Oh, it feels hot and sweaty, but uh, well, then that's not too bad. There's things for the kids to enjoy, like our carousel and our train ride. So I see utter delight in their faces and eyes. There's nothing like riding on a train. The custard is amazing around here. It's real good. <laughs> Run! 1840s baseball, Massachusetts rules. There's no strikes, fouls, or balls. Swung till you hit the ball. We love history, and we learn something new each and every time we come. You get a feeling that they've really learned something, and... Yeah, it makes it, uh, makes it worth it. A collection of craft buildings such as pottery, glass blowing, and tin shops provide demonstrations while producing materials used in the village and for sale. Greenfield Village has 240 acres of land, of which only 90 acres are used for the attraction the rest being forest river and extra pasture for the sheep and horses. Some of the most notable homes and buildings include Noah Webster's Connecticut Home, the Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop and Home from Dayton, Ohio, 
Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory from New Jersey Henry Ford's birthplace. Henry Ford's prototype garage. Where he built the quadricycle. Harvey Firestone's family farm. The Logan County, Illinois Courts House where Abraham Lincoln practiced law. William Holmes McGuffey's birthplace. And Luther Burbank's office. Some of the most notable homes and buildings include Noah Webster's Connecticut Home The Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop and Home from Dayton, Ohio Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory from New Jersey Henry Ford's Birthplace Henry Ford's Prototype Garage Well he built the quadricycle Harvey Firestone's Family Farm The Logan County, Illinois Courthouse where Abraham Lincoln practiced law William Holmes McGuffey's birthplace And Luther Burbank's office a man named Henry Ford, who had left the farm and come to the city to tinker with machinery, was making what he called a quadricycle. It looked like a buggy, only it had no shafts for a horse to be harnessed to. The horsepower was going to come from a gasoline engine he'd made himself. He did everything himself, working nights and holding down a daytime job with the Detroit Illuminating Company. It took a long while to make this machine, but Henry Ford stuck to it, and finally it was ready. One momentous night, he pushed it out for its first trial run. This is a garden and covered bridge at Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. This is the Harvey Firestone Family Farm. This is the Armington and Sons Machine Shop. This is Henry Ford's birthplace. The transportation system provides rides by horse-drawn omnibus. Steam locomotive. A 1931 Model AA bus, one of about 15 left known to exist. And authentic Ford Model Ts. This is Henry Ford's prototype garage. Well he built the quadricycle. This is one of several steam locomotives in Greenfield Village. This reconstructed DT and M roundhouse is a replica of an 1884 railroad maintenance building built in Marshall, Michigan. By the Michigan and Ohio Railroad. The Pear Marquette Railway used this turntable. Built in 1901. This is a steam locomotive. Greenfield Village's Edison Illumination Company. Built in Greenfield Village in 1944. 
is the partial reconstruction. One quarter size of Station A. The first of the Edison Illuminating Company's early Poe plants in Detroit Station and one of the first electric Poe plants in the city of Detroit. Station A served Detroit customers with safe and inexpensive direct current DC electrical Poe for homes and businesses from 1886 to 1900. Co-burning boilers on the first flue provided Poe to steam engines which we connected to the dynamos of the Edison Illuminating Company above. This is the Logan County, Illinois courthouse in which Lincoln had practiced law in the 1840s. Sir John Bennett's clock, watch, and jewelry store in London, England. Originally stood five stories. Mr. Ford was especially attracted to the Gog and Magog figures who strike the clock. Henry Ford, a watch enthusiast, purchased the building for his historic village in 1928. A young Henry J. Heinz began bottling his first product, horseradish, in his family's Sharpsburg, Pennsylvania home. Heinz moved the house, by barge, to his company's Pittsburgh factory in 1904. In the mid-1890s, widow Elizabeth Cohen operated a millinery shop here, offering customers fashionable headwear while supporting her young family. The Wright Cycle Shop is the bicycle shop where the Wright brothers worked on their first flying machine. This is Wilbur and Orville Wright's house and bicycle shop. This is the Wright brothers' house. It originally stood in Dayton, Ohio, and was moved to Greenfield Village. These are three crucibles in Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory. At the left a boiler and a small steam engine. This is upstairs at Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory. The Sarah Jordan boarding house is where Thomas Edison's bachelor assistants lived here while working on such inventions as the phonograph, telephone transmitter, and incandescent lamp. To celebrate New Year's Eve 1879, they wired their house, their laboratory, and the street between, making this the world's first electrically lit home. Both Ford and Edison had a vacation home in Fort Myers, Florida. This well-equipped laboratory enabled Edison to continue his investigations, even as he seemed to seek a break from business and other matters. In addition to lending some charm, covering a bridge protects its wooden truss work from weather, extending the structural service life. Joshua Ackley and Daniel Klaus built the Ackley Covered Bridge in 1832 across Wheeling Creek in southwestern Pennsylvania. Cotswold Cottage is from the Cotswold Hills in southwest England. The Fords we attracted to the distinctive character of Cotswold buildings, which are characterized by the yellow brown stone, tall gables, steeply pitched roofs, and stone ornamentation around windows and doors. Several decorative additions we made to the house in England before dismantling and age erecting it in Greenfield Village. Noah Webster wrote the first dictionary of the American English language in this house that was constructed about 1823 in New Haven, Connecticut. Thomas Edison's grandparents built and lived in this home on their farm in Vienna, Ontario. Louis Feberbank, 1849-1926, was a plant breeder, naturalist and auto and was especially noted for his experiments with plants, fruits, and vegetables. He was born in this house, built around 1800 and originally located in Lancaster, Massachusetts. Although he attended local schools there, much of his knowledge about Natu and plant life came from reading books at the public library. 
although Burbank attended local schools there. Much of his knowledge about nature and plant life came from reading books at the public library. Part of Henry Ford's love of the past stemmed from his fondness for the McGuffey readers he had read as a boy. But collecting hundreds of readers was not enough to satisfy his yearning to reclaim this part of his past in 1932. He purchased the log birthplace of William Holmes McGuffey and moved it to Greenfield Village. The McGuffey School was built in Greenfield Village in 1934. Created out of barn logs from the 1790s southwestern Pennsylvania farmstead, where textbook author William Holmes McGuffey was born. Children living in frontier communities learned to read in rustic schoolhouses like this one. McGuffey's eclectic readers gave them an easy, standardized way to do it. This is where William Holmes McGuffey was born in 1800. Henry Ford built this cabin in 1942 to honor his friend, agricultural scientist George Washington Carver. The cabin was based on Carver's recollections of the slave cabin in Missouri in which he was born in 1864. Carver spent his career at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, advocating for new crops, such as peanuts, that would enrich both southern farmers and southern soils. Charles Proteus Steinmetz maintained a small cabin overlooking the Mohawk River near Schenectady, New York. A house at Greenfield Village. The Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation is a large indoor and outdoor history museum complex and a National Historic Landmark in Dearborn. It is the largest indoor and outdoor museum complex in the United States and is visited by over 1.7 million people each year. This is a map of the exhibit area of the Henry Ford Museum. This is another map of the exhibit area of the Henry Ford Museum. A Ford Model T gives rides at the Henry Ford Museum. This is a 1949 Volkswagen on exhibit at the Henry Ford Museum. This is the Fokker F the 3M flown by Richard E. Bird to the Arctic. This is Ford's 1896 Quad Recycle. This is an Oath F4 1896 quadricycle. This is a 1916 Anderson on exhibit at the Henry Ford Museum. This is Ford's Intracto number no. 1 on exhibit at the Henry Ford Museum. This is Teddy Roosevelt's Brown from 1902. This is FDR's 1939 Lincoln K-Series Sunshine Special. This V12 powered car was the first purpose built presidential limo. The Lincoln K series was the first presidential vehicle to feature wide running boards and handles for Secret Service agents. This is Eisenhower's 1950 Lincoln bubble top. This is JFK's Lincoln Continental four door convertible X100. This is the vehicle in which Kennedy was assassinated. This is Ronald Reagan's 1972 Lincoln Continental. Reagan's 1972 Lincoln was outfitted with military-grade armor plating and PPG's bulletproof glass. This car is the one that carried President Reagan to the hospital after being shot by John Hinckley in 1981. This is the Amelia Earhart exhibit. Amelia Earhart was the founder of the 99s, a women's aviation group that still exists today. The Ford Tri-Motor was the most popular airliner of the late 1920s and early 1930s. Its rugged dependability led Richard Byrd to choose a Tri-Motor for his attempt to be the first person to fly over the South Pole in 1929. Byrd and a crew of three achieved that goal in this plane. The Ford Trimoto was the most popular airliner of the late 1920s and early 1930s. 
Its rugged dependability led Richard Byrne to choose a trimoto for his attempt to be the first person to fly over the South Pole. In 1929, Bird and a crew of three achieved that goal in this plane. Igor Sikorsky's VS-300 was America's first practical helicopter and the first successful helicopter in the world to perfect the now familiar single main rotor and tail rotor design. The VS-300 was first flown in 1939. The Douglas DC-3 ranks with the Model T Ford and the Volkswagen Beetle as one of the great engineering designs of the 20th century. The aircraft was safe, reliable, and economical and did more than any other single airplane to make commercial aviation a viable industry. The Allegheny locomotive was the largest, fastest, and most powerful steam locomotive ever built. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railway's massive Allegheny, introduced in 1941, represents the peak of steam technology. Among the largest and most powerful steam locomotives ever built, it weighed 1.2 million pounds with its tende and could generate 7,500 horse a week. Just 11 years later, though, the C and O began pulling these giants from service. Diesel locomotives proved more flexible and less expensive. The New York Central Railroad built this replica of the DeWitt Clinton for the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. The original locomotive was built in 1831 and operated on the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad, a New York Central predecessor. The replica traveled to fairs, expositions, and promotional events across the New York Central system into the 1950s. Inside this bus in 1955, Rosa Parks, a soft-spoken African-American seamstress, refused to give up Hesse to a white man, breaking existing segregation laws. For this, Many believe Rosa Parks' act was the event that sparked the civil rights movement. President Abraham Lincoln was sitting in this rocking chair during a production of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington when he was assassinated on April 14, 1865. George Washington carried folding beds, tents, eating utensils, and other equipment to use while encamped on the field with his troops during the Revolutionary War. Washington likely used this bed when he traveled from his Newburgh, New York headquarters in July 1783, as the war was winding down to tour upstate New York and the military installations located there. This is the massive Corliss stationary steam engine of 1859. Recommended videos Detroit and Greenfield Village. Recommended video, the Henry Ford's Innovation Nation playlist. Recommended video, the Henry Ford, who we are. Recommended video, top 10 best tourist places to visit in Detroit. Recommended video, Top 15 Best Places to Visit in Michigan. Recommended video, The Rise and Fall of Detroit, Michigan. Table of Contents, Detroit and Greenfield Village. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.